few things that are happening right here at RFA. Today is our glow-in-the-dark Easter egg hunt, starting at 5 p.m., located at the Activities Complex, for ages 0 through 6th grade. As a reminder, today is also the day for Smoke Ribs for Missions pickup. Be sure to get with a missions team member to pick up your order. Our He's Alive Passion Play starts this week beginning with dress rehearsal at 7 p.m. on Monday the 3rd. We highly encourage our RFA family to attend the dress rehearsal, making sure we have plenty of seating for the community. As our number one outreach, we want to ensure that we're not having to turn away our visitors during the four public presentations, which times are shown on screen. And finally, as a reminder, there will be no Sunday school on Easter Sunday in between services. Worship times are still at 8.30 and 10.45 a.m. Once again, thank you for joining us this morning right here at RFA. Were you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Would you stand and worship with us? And I was buried my shame who could carry that kind away it was my turn till I met you and I was breathing but
sinner heavy The chains break at the weight of your glory I need a shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healer
that try to hide this precious blood that gave me life. But in three days, he breathed again, and he rose to stand in my, in my defense. So I come to tell you he's alive, to tell you that he cries every tear that falls. Hallelujah. So I come to tell you that he stays to show that you the faith. He's coming back. He's coming back for you. Oh, yes, so I come to tell you that he stays to show that you the faith. He's coming back. He's coming back. Come on, that precious blood, church. He's worthy of our praise and adoration. The blood that was poured out on the altar so that we can become sons and daughters of the Most High. Amen. He's so good.
next song we're about to sing is a new one but it's called fresh wind how many knows that we are not satisfied with just yesterday's anointing just yesterday's move but we need we have a right now God and he can meet us right here amen he has a fresh wind that he wants to blow into our lives and so it is new but I want the words to minister to you this morning and I just want you just to press in anyway because it's worth singing about because we need a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And 
Turn from sin, revival in the smoldering breath of God, fan us into flame. Cause we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out for hearts that burn. Holy fear, purify faith indeed, refine us by strength in what remains. So we the church bear your light, lamp of fire, city bright, king and kingdoms come is what we pray. Come on. The fragrance of heaven, pour your spirit out, and pour your spirit out, the holy anointing, the power of your presence, pour your spirit out, and pour your spirit out, because we need a prayer. Bring it to me. 
Lord, we need you this morning. Lord, we need that revival, that personal revival, that refreshing, the fresh wind of your spirit to blow across our heart again. Father, would you do it? Would you do it today? Oh, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. You are welcome in this place. We praise you, we praise you, we praise you. Right there where you're standing or sitting, would you lift up your hands one more time? And would you just pray that prayer with me? Lord, do it again in my life. Lord, do it again in my life. Father, I know that there's more. I know that there's more. Lord, I pray that you would revive. Lord, that you would restore. God, that you would awaken, Lord, those things in us that need to be awakened, Father, today. Oh, so that we can be the light that you've called us to be, the witness that you've empowered us to be. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in our life. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Come and do what only you can do. Empowering, strengthening, lifting up, anointing for works of service for the kingdom. Oh God, we need you. We need you. We need you, Lord, this morning. Would you touch your neighbor this morning? I just feel this today. I sense the Lord doing something in this room this morning. Would you just touch your neighbor? If it's someone you know, maybe you feel comfortable enough grabbing their hand or just touching them on the arm. Would you just begin to pray for that person on your right and left today? Oh, God, may this not be just another day. Lord, may this not be just another service, just another church service, Lord. But God, today, may we come alive again. Father, there are some in this room this morning that need a fresh touch of heaven. Lord, they need a fresh encounter with you. Lord, would you do that today? Would you do that in all of us today, Lord? May we leave this place, Lord, not wondering if you're real, not wondering if you're moving, but Lord, right in the middle of what you're doing. God, do it in us. And Father, every need that's represented in this room this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would meet. God, that you would meet. May your kingdom come rushing into that place of need. And Lord, may there be provision. May there be healing. God, may there be breakthrough, Lord. In Jesus' name, strengthen and encourage and build up, Lord. Oh, God, have your way in us. Have your way in us, Lord. We don't live for ourselves, but we live for you. We live for you. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Father, I ask these things in your glorious name, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And amen. Would you hug that person next to you, shake their hand, give them a high five. Powerful, powerful presence of the Lord in here this morning. Wow. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, God. Amazing God. Hallelujah. Oh, I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Father, do it again. Do it again. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. Hallelujah. Just want to remind you of a couple of things that's been announced this morning, and that is uh, uh, no Sunday school next Sunday, Easter Sunday morning. Due to the classrooms being just in play mode right now, or they will be, uh, and we'll be doing one one more production Sunday night. So we're we're going to need all of those classrooms set up the way that they will that they will be set up for the play. That will just be helpful. So service times will be the same Easter Sunday, eight thirty and ten forty five, um, but no Sunday school in between. So just to let you know that, and also. Um, um, if you have ribs that you need to pick up, please pick those up today. We have a number of new members that's, that's been uh, uh, brought into the church. You can see that little insert in your bulletin. Uh, just excited about what the Lord is doing uh, there. And I'm also excited to, to uh, 
talk about one of our newest members, and that's baby Zayden, uh, who was born this past week. And uh, just, uh, you know, of course, baby Zayden still needs some prayer, still in the hospital, and still needs God to, to work in him. Uh, but just excited to have new life. Amen? Excited. If you were paying attention on Friday, obviously there were some devastating storms that rolled through our state. And uh, I did talk to a couple of pastors yesterday. Uh, pastor Mark Bateman, uh, who is the pastor at MacArthur in Jacksonville. And then I talked to Pastor Matt uh, Hodges, who's the pastor in Wynn. Both of those communities were hit pretty hard. And, uh, you know, of course, in Wynn, uh, the last I've heard, there were, there were four fatalities. And, and so if you would like to donate or give, much like what we did last week for those in Mississippi who were negatively impacted um, by, the, by the tornadoes, you, you can give. <clears throat> if you give, make sure that you just designate that to... Uh, some type of, uh, you know, put on your, your, your giving, uh, disaster relief, tornado, something like that, that we know where to, where to send that money. Um, <clears throat> but in spite of it all, and I noticed this on Friday, that, that just about every single one of the places, uh, whether it was a shelter, whether it was a staging area for the different aid that was coming in to those communities, just about all of those places were connected to a church. And in times like this, the church is so important. Uh, and, you know, it's easy to be the light when, when everybody's excited and everything is well. But when you go through uh, very challenging times like this, uh, for us to step up and just to be there, just to, just to be the light for those who have been negatively impacted is, is very important. And so I want to just remind you of all of that. Uh, and, and, and then also, uh, don't, don't forget about the Easter egg hunt. If you have a, a child or a grandchild that, that wants to be a part of that today, this afternoon, uh, glow in the dark Easter egg hunt over at the activities building. So lots of things going on as always. Stay plugged into your bulletin and different things of that nature. If you have the scriptures with you this morning, I want you to turn to uh, Acts chapter 2, and I'll be there in a minute, verses 38 and 39. And and uh, I'm going to start off this morning in Luke 24, 49. And I'm talking to you, and we're still in the series of the promises, the promises. The first promise that we talked about a few weeks ago was the promise of everlasting life. Last week we talked about the promise of divine healing. We, we believe in a God who heals. Uh, this week, this morning, I want to speak to you for just a few moments on the promise of spirit baptism or baptism in the Holy Spirit. The clock up there is not working, so if you see me look at my watch, I am trying to be timely, all right? I have no clock. Do you trust me? <laughs> but if you see me look down, I am trying to be timely. So, <clears throat> Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 49. We're just going to read one verse of Scripture here. The Bible says this, uh, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Let me read that to you again. They're going to keep that on the screen. Jesus says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. This promise would bring power from on high, and this is referring to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would begin at Pentecost. The promise is also, this promise is also recorded in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 32, verse 15, it records this, Until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high. Isaiah 44, verse 3, For I will pour water on him who is thirsty, and floods on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Ezekiel 39, 29. And I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. And then, of course, Joel 28, Joel 2, 28, I should say. And it shall come to pass that afterward I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. It's just a few instances in the Old Testament where the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is given to us. It's a promise that we're to walk in. 
And of course, throughout the New Testament, we can find this in John chapter 14, 16, and 17, and also verse 26, John chapter 15, verse number 26, John 16, verse number 7, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, verse number 33, and then where we will be here in just a few moments, 38 and 39. But the disciples, as they were waiting for this promise, Jesus gives them this command in Luke 24 to go and to wait for something. Keep in mind, they didn't understand what they were waiting for. They didn't know what to look for. They didn't know what necessarily to expect. All they were told is that this was going to be a promise from the Father. The Bible says that one of the things that they did was they devoted themselves to united and continued prayer. As they waited for the fulfillment of this promise. Let me just interject something to you about the things of God that I think is important before we get into this. A promise is for anyone who wants it. Throughout this book, a promise is for anyone who wants it. Salvation is provided for us. God promises to provide for all of our needs. But this is something that I've experienced in my life and I just want to share it with you. He promises to provide for all of our needs. But the things that we want, we have to go after. The things that we want, we have to go after. You can get to heaven sick. You can get to heaven with one leg, with one eye, with one ear. You can get to heaven uh, you know, battling all kinds of disease. But you can't get to heaven unsaved. He provides a way of salvation. He provides empowerment for us on this side of eternity. Listen, the promise of the Father is not for us in eternity. It's for us. He is for us here today on this side of eternity. But what I've discovered in my life that the things that I want, I have to go after. He provides for my needs. But the things I want, I have to go after. And that's what we see here with these disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 14. They were... They were united in continued prayer as they were waiting for the promise of the Father to be fulfilled. The Bible says this in Acts 1.14, And these all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. The Greek word here means same mind or spirit. Christ's followers before Pentecost faithfully joined together in obedience to Jesus' instructions to wait For the Father's promise of the Holy Spirit. So can we experience the Holy Spirit's power today? You know, when I got saved, and this is pretty important, because I was scared that I would lose that experience. I knew I was a mess. I knew I had a lot of issues in my life. And there were a lot of things that the Lord was was working through me and was going to have to work through me because... I didn't just get delivered from everything instantly. It was a process through through some of that. And I remember that that I would have these thoughts from time to time of the Lord, or not of the Lord, but but, but about the Lord and about losing the experience that I'd had. Uh, Church, that experience that I had that night when I gave my life to Christ was so real. I mean, it rocked me to the core. It wasn't just an emotional high. It wasn't just, just, just some fluke. I encountered him, and when I encountered him, I've never been the same, never been the same. And I remember walking through some of these times and some of these things that I was having to to walk through with the help of the Holy Spirit, and it wasn't always easy. And in the back of my mind, I had this gnawing thought, just, you know, you're going to lose this experience. You're going to lose this experience. You're going to lose this experience. The Bible tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15 and 6, I don't have this in my notes, but I'm just going to paraphrase this, that Jesus appears to over 500 people at one time before he is finally ascended up into heaven. He appears to over 500 at one point in time after he has been raised from the dead, showing himself, but yet we only find 120 in the upper room because the things of God that you want, you have to go after. Amen? You have to go after. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart 
from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Notice the word promise in Jesus' statement. The promise of the Father is a promise that is not about a what, but a, but a who. Keeping in mind Jesus' description of the Holy Spirit as a promise, and look at what happened in the immediate aftermath of the Holy Spirit's outpouring on Pentecost Sunday. After the sound and the commotion in Acts chapter 2 draws a huge crowd to the area of Jerusalem where the 120 are gathered, the Bible says this in Acts 2 verse number 12, that they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this mean? They heard all of these people being filled with the Spirit. And as these different individuals, men and women and everyone who was in that upper room, the Bible says that all of them were filled. They were raising their voices. They were praying in the Spirit. This drew a crowd. And the people that came hearing what was going on, that they were perplexed, asking what could this mean. And of course, in response to this, Peter stands up and he delivers one of the first Holy Spirit-inspired prophetic sermons ever. Off the cuff, Peter cites Old Testament passages that spoke of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and how his coming would empower God's people to prophesy. The formerly timid Peter finishes by boldly proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. In support of Peter's preaching, the Holy Spirit does what he was specifically sent to do. He began to convict hearts and to draw people to Jesus. Look at verse number 37 of Acts chapter 2. It says this, that now when they heard this, talking about Peter's message, his sermon, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted by the Spirit. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? These people had witnessed a supernatural demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power and heard a sermon about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and was, that, that was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And again, look at their response. Men and brethren, what shall we do? With their question, they were really asking, what do we need to do to have the relationship with God like what you have? We see that there's something different about you. We see that there's something more in your life. There were thousands of people who had gathered into that region and certainly thousands into the city of Jerusalem because of the festival that was going on. They were religious people, but they were lacking something. The power of the Spirit. And then look at verses 38 and 39 where you are. Peter answers their question and he says this, then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, again, He is a promise. The promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Notice that Peter outlines three things that's very important. Number one, he tells them to repent. He tells them to repent. Why is repentance important when it comes to getting saved? Because repentance is turning away from the sin that you were involved in. You've all raised children, or many of you have raised children, or you have grandchildren, and you understand what it means to discipline a child. When they've done something that they shouldn't do, and even if they say they're sorry, but they go right back to it, they're not really sorry, are they? That's why repentance is so important. You don't hear this word a lot in today's grammar and in today's vernacular. But repentance means that we turn away from mentally and even physically the sin that we've been doing. In that moment, the Holy Spirit has highlighted it. He's, he's shown us that, that that's wrong. He's convicted our heart just like he did to that group of people who heard Peter's sermon. They were cut to the heart. There was something happening that was spiritual. And they repented. He tells them to repent. Joel chapter 2 verse 13, Joel says this, So rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. 
For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. He tells them, listen, don't just do an outside religious act. Oftentimes, Jewish people would rend their garments. They would put sack or they would put on sackcloth and they'd put ashes on their head when they were mourning or as a sign of repentance. But Joel here, church, the prophet Joel here is, is pushing all of that aside. And he said, Listen, what's going on on the inside of you? Is there true repentance? Repent and turn back to the Lord. Peter tells them to do the same thing. Secondly, he tells them to be water baptized. In a couple of weeks, April 16, we're going to be having a water baptism. Now listen, we've had several people saved over the last few weeks. If you've been one of those and you've given your heart and life to the Lord, you need to be water baptized. April the 16th, reach out to the church office and we can help you with that. But the act of water baptism is symbolically, it, it is declaring to everyone that the old sinful life and lifestyle of that baptized believer has died with Christ at salvation and a new spiritual being has been raised with Christ into a new life. Matthew 28, 19 says this, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, speaking of water baptism, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Church, I believe that everyone who decides to follow Christ should be water baptized. Everyone. You need to be water baptized. Mark 1, 9, and it came to pass, and in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Jesus himself was baptized. Peter is basically saying you need to repent, you need to be water baptized, and then thirdly, he says the gift of the Holy Spirit will come to you. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Every believer, listen to me, Every believer, after turning from his or her sin and accepting Jesus Christ by faith, must receive, I believe, they should receive a personal baptism in the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3, 13 and 14 says this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Why did he do this? So that we could be saved and have a right relationship with God. But look at verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The content of God's promise to Abraham is defined as the promise of the Father or the Holy Spirit. To receive God's Spirit is to have righteousness, renewed life, and all other blessings that come from a right relationship with God. Some might argue Paul is talking about salvation here. But look what Paul goes on to say in Galatians 4, 4 through 6. He says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, that means you've been engrafted into the family. You're not an outsider anymore, but you're a son or you're a daughter. What does that mean? That means that you've been saved, correct? Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying out, Abba, Father. All true believers have the Holy Spirit within them when they get saved. But in this passage, Paul may have in mind the baptism in the Holy Spirit and his continual filling. In Acts chapter 1, verse number 5, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. There's a distinction. Acts 2, 4. But they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They've been baptized in the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And this is a very important scripture for us who have been filled, who are following Christ. He says, do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That, that, that last line, but be filled with the Spirit, speaks of a continual filling. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not just a one-time occurrence that happened years and years ago. But as we walk in this relationship with the Lord, we are to continually stay full of Him. We need a fresh wind. The fragrance from heaven, pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out. The baptized, 
The baptism of the Spirit is not a requirement for salvation. But throughout the book of Acts, the gift or the promise of the Spirit was something that individuals consciously desired, received, and applied. Acts 4.31 And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. These are folks that's already been saved. But there was something more. Not that they needed the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit to be saved, but there's more. Salvation is step one. That that gets you there. But church, we need the Holy Spirit in our life and more of Him in our life. Acts 8, 14 through 17. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, Listen, they had received the word of God. They sent Peter and John to them who, when they had come down, they prayed for them that they might, what? That they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means water baptism. And then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Acts 19, starting in verse number 2. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Now let me stop there, and I want you to look at that. Who is Paul talking to? Disciples. Disciples of who? Jesus. This is post-conversion. They've been saved. And what's the question that church notice that he doesn't try to witness to them about Jesus? Why? Because they were disciples. They already knew. This is something more. He asked them the question Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, We have not so much as heard whether there was a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into, uh, into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism, which we know, and of course, Paul says this. John indeed, verse number 4, baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and they prophesied. This is the promise of the Father. I want you to know that there's more than just scraping by waiting for your time to be over. There is a promise from God called the Holy Spirit. And as we are baptized into Him, there's more. Pastor Rob, would you come? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I jotted this down on my notes just this morning. Verse number 13, I want to show you something that's important. Part of this is doctrinal teaching. I want you to know what you believe, why we do what we do. 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 13 says this, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free. Keep that on the screen for just a moment, Christy, if you would. Look at the word by, which is the second word in that verse. For by... Look at that word by. That's a preposition meaning through the agency or instrumentality of. In other words, the word by refers to who is doing the baptizing in this verse. Who's doing the baptizing in this verse? The Holy Spirit. Who is the one who draws us to the cross? It's the Holy Spirit at salvation. Paul here is referring to salvation. We've all been baptized by one spirit into one body. When someone gives their heart and life to Jesus Christ, they are saved. They are in the body of Christ, something bigger than they are. And that's glorious and that's wonderful. And that's what is necessary for salvation. But God didn't just stop there. He gave us another promise. Why is this important that I'm telling you this? Because I want you to look at Matthew chapter 3, verse number 11. She'll put it up on the screen right here. 
I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This is John the Baptist speaking. But he who is coming after me, speaking of Jesus, is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse number 8. I indeed baptize you with water, but he, speaking of Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Look at Luke chapter 3, verse 16. You need to see this. John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water. Are you getting the point? But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Look at John chapter 1, verse 33. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me. This is John again, John the Baptist. Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I just showed you two different baptisms. One that the Holy Spirit does at conversion. But then there's another baptism that Jesus himself does. This is significant because the Gospels don't read the same. And any of you that's been in the church understand that, that the Gospel writers, they wrote from a different perspective and they wrote to different audiences. But the death and resurrection of Jesus is written about in all four Gospels. So is the baptism of the Spirit I just showed you. In all four Gospels. Why? Because it's important. It's important. Some will say, I don't need the baptism of the Spirit. I don't need the baptism of the Spirit, Pastor, to get to heaven. You don't. But He's given the Holy Spirit to us as a promise. Probably none of us in this room would turn away salvation from Jesus and what He's paid on the cross for us to have. Why would you turn away the very baptism that He wants to give you? It's the same Jesus. The same Jesus. If you're here this morning and you need more of God, I'd like to pray with you. Would you stand with me today? You say, Pastor, it's early. It's 930. I believe that the Lord wants to introduce you to this promise today. If you're here and you've never been baptized in the Spirit, you've never experienced, and it's not, He's not just an experience, He's a person. I shared with you, I I didn't forget what I started a few moments ago when I said when I got saved, I was always concerned about losing the experience, what God, I mean, just the feeling, and there, there was such a shift in my life. But when I was baptized in the Spirit, (laughs) I don't have to worry about losing anything because He's always with me. He's always with me. And I know that sometimes in Pentecostal circles, we have made the Holy Spirit to be weird. I don't believe that He is. I believe people are weird. I don't believe the Spirit's weird. Why do I say that? Well, I don't have time to get into the Greek when Jesus is introducing the Holy Spirit to his disciples, how he would be the same as Jesus. If you think Jesus is weird, well, then you might think the Holy Spirit's weird, but I don't think Jesus was weird. Jesus did things that we didn't always understand. The Holy Spirit will move on you to do things you might not always understand. But the Holy Spirit has been sent for us as a comforter, as a helper, And it was so important. He was so important that Jesus' last words, some of his last words on the planet, going back to where we started, Luke 24. The Bible says this. This is Jesus speaking. Thus it is written, verse 46, And thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should, should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses of these things, Jesus says in verse 48, verse 49. He says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And then Jesus is raised up in front of them into heaven. 
So let me just open this up like this this morning. If you're here and you'd say, Pastor, I just want more of God. Let me see your hand real quick. Totally putting you on the spot, I know. But just help me this morning. Okay, many of you this morning. I just want more of God. I just want more of God. That's, that's where this journey begins. That's where this journey begins. If you'll just go after Him, you'll experience Him. He promises that. If you seek Him with all of your heart, you'll find Him. He's not trying to hide from you. Pastor Rob's going to lead us in some worship. If you want, you don't have to. We have a few minutes. If you want and you'd like to come to the altar area and just worship, you can do that. The altars are open. Pastor Rob's going to lead us. You just want more of God. Starts with worship. Starts with just getting into a place of worship. Just going after Him. I believe that God will meet you. I believe that God will meet you. I believe He'll touch you. Is there anybody that would like to come forward and just spend some time? I just want more of the Lord today in my life. The altars are open. This is not about salvation this morning. This is just about more of God. I need more of Him in my life. I need more of Him in my life. Lord, do it in me. Do it in me. Do it in me. Let's worship together.